China has taken a bold step to protect its interests and gain more influence. It has built massive artificial islands, equipped with military installations and defense capabilities. But as the world looked on, China didn't see the big problem coming that would mess up its plan for more power. Here's what happened. China aims to be the world's leading superpower by the year 2049, the centennial of the Chinese Communist Party's victory over the nationalists in the Civil War and rise to power on the mainland. Unfortunately for Beijing, China's own geography works against it in achieving this goal. China is surrounded by hostile islands that prevent it from projecting power into the world's oceans and threaten to cut off the shipping its economy relies on. To help mitigate this geographical disadvantage, China has attempted to increase its power in the strategically vital South China Sea, seizing control of disputed islands, rocks and reefs. China has since fortified these areas by creating artificial islands and militarizing them with airfields and hangars, radar stations, anti-aircraft weapons, and ship-killing hardware. The United States and China's neighbors in the region watched this island-building campaign with great alarm, marveling at how quickly China built and militarized its islands. However, these artificial islands aren't all they're cracked up to be. In trying to solve one problem, China only created another. Let's just say that these islands might not have the staying power that China needs them to have if it wants to use them as an effective method of power projection in the first island chain. Let's explore the reasons why China built the islands to begin with, why these islands are now in trouble, and why Beijing's ambitions in the South China Sea might sink, literally. The legal origin of the artificial islands comes from China's infamous Nine Dash Line map, which it has used to claim 90% of the waters in the South China Sea. Officially, China justifies this claim and the Nine Dash Line with historical anecdotes. For example, China maintains that it and its people had been in the South China Sea since the days of the mythical Xia Dynasty that supposedly began in about the year 2070 BC. Naturally, few people believe these assertions. The historical claims were fig leaves to hide a more cynical, self-interested motive. The South China Sea's waters are economically and geostrategically vital. Economically, the South China Sea has about 15% of the world's total fishing potential, 11 billion barrels of oil, and 190 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. In 2021, 22% of the world's global trade, valued at about $5.3 trillion, passed through the shipping lanes in this area, including 60% of all maritime trade, 40% of the world's petroleum products, and one-third of the world's total shipping. Simply put, whoever controls these waters controls the fates of the countries that rely on this trade. China is one such country. By building its artificial islands and fortifying the area, China can more easily protect its own trade, muscle in on the natural resources in the South China Sea, and exclude the access of other nations, or at least charge them expensive tolls for the use of such resources. Geostrategically, however, the South China Sea is still trapped within the first island chain, to make matters worse for Beijing, these island nations are aligned with China's strategic rival, the United States. Because of the geopolitical alignment, the United States Navy can easily blockade a series of choke points around the South China Sea and disrupt or cut off shipping to the Chinese mainland. The most important of these choke points is the Strait of Malacca, through which China gets a large portion of its energy. In 2016, 16 million barrels of oil and 3.2 million barrels of liquefied natural gas pass through these narrow waters every day, a figure that is likely now higher. China's dependency on the trade that passes through this choke point has been called its Malacca Dilemma, and Beijing has often used this supposed vulnerability as an excuse for its territorial expansion in the area. By building and militarizing islands, China can theoretically bring more ships, aircraft, and missiles closer to the Strait of Malacca and other hotspots giving it more leverage over the choke points and making it more costly for the United States Navy to project power into the first island chain. To make a long story short, China wants to seize control of the rocks and reefs in the South China Sea to promote its own self-interest at the expense of other nations like the Philippines, Malaysia, and Vietnam, on whose exclusive economic zones Beijing has encroached. A 2016 ruling against Beijing by the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague which completely invalidated the Nine Dash Line as a legitimate territorial claim, was simply ignored. As is often the case in international relations, the strong do what they can, 
and the weak suffer what they must. China had expanded its reach into the South China Sea through military means since the 1970s, when it seized control of the Paracel Islands from Vietnam. However, China began its modern campaign in the South China Sea when it seized control of the Scarborough Shoal from the Philippines in 2012. The following year, China started to expand much further. It began building artificial islands in the Spratlys, creating 3,200 new acres of land, militarizing the islands as the years went by. In total, China has 28 outposts in the waters of its supposed Nine-Dash Line Map. 20 of these outposts are in the Paracel Islands, an additional seven are in the Spratlys, and it also has the Scarborough Shoal. The artificial island building campaign centered mostly on the Spratlys. Artificial islands are created by dredging and shifting material from the reefs and seafloor beneath them. Rocks and sand must be pulverized in this process and, naturally, the creation of artificial islands was destructive to the wildlife in the area. Mounds of material needed to be pulverized and moved in the process. The American Admiral Harry Harris, who was commander of the United States Pacific Fleet at the time these constructions were taking place, called these artificial islands China's Great Wall of Sand. In a speech delivered to the Australian Strategic Policy Institute in March 2015, according to an analysis by the Center for Strategic and International Studies, China has reclaimed a total of 13.5 square kilometers of land across the seven reefs it has used in its island building campaign. China's island building vessels can dredge up material at impressive rates. Just one of them, the Tianjin Hao, operated by CCCC Tianjin Dredging, can deploy a cutter with the power of 4,200 kilowatts to the seabed. Material is then moved through a pipeline ashore for land reclamation purposes or onto a barge. The Tianjin Hao can deploy its cutter to a depth of 30 meters and extract 4,500 cubic meters of material per hour. Between February and March 2014, this ship was spotted conducting dredging operations in Johnson Reef in the Spratly Islands. This area has now been occupied by China and the reef has since been militarized. Although Johnson Reef is too small to host aircraft, it is armed with anti-aircraft guns and radar systems, contributing to a potential Chinese defense in depth of the area should hostilities break out in the region. CSIS considers Johnson Reef to have been a test run for more sophisticated military structures at more famous and well-armed places like Fiery Cross Reef, Mischief Reef, and Subi Reef. The Tianjin Hao was far from the only such ship in China's dredging operations, which can only be described as having been a success. To counter China's Great Wall of Sand island-building campaign, the United States Navy has conducted Freedom of Navigation Operations FONOPS, since 2015. These operations see the close transit of US Navy ships and aircraft around the artificial islands in an attempt to ensure that the South China Sea's shipping lanes stay open. These FONOPs have done little to alter the situation in the South China Sea, however, and numerous close calls between the American and Chinese militaries in the area have led some in Washington to call for them to end. On the flip side, other national security strategists believe that ending the FONOPs and essentially ceding the military prerogative in the area to China would only allow Beijing to entrench itself in the region that much further. Without the United States Navy maintaining a presence in the area, they fear that China's People's Liberation Army Navy would be completely unfettered in asserting its will over the shipping lanes and other countries in the area. Fortunately for the United States and China's weaker regional neighbors, the US Navy might no longer need to do the heavy work alone. Nature itself is assisting in the effort to prevent Chinese hegemony in the South China Sea because the artificial islands are starting to erode and sink. As early as 2019, it became apparent that China's islands were not as stable as Beijing was hoping for. In the first place, China has extended its reputation for often shoddy construction methods to the new islands. The Economist reported that the concrete China used in building the island bases could not cope with the elemental settings in the area. This concrete was instead turning to sponge in such conditions. Additionally, there is vast corruption within China's construction industry. This corruption has extended to China's military ambitions before, for example, in 2019, Su Bo, the overseer of construction for China's Liaoning aircraft carrier, was convicted on corruption charges and sentenced to 12 years in prison. Corruption in the construction industry has often led to substandard work, and the same appears to be the case on many of the artificial islands in the South China Sea. As is often the case, China appears to have cut corners in its construction methods, 
the concrete which displayed problems was not laid properly on all of the islands. For best results, metal rods should have first been driven into the seabed and then a concrete retaining wall built around the island. This was not always the case, and the structural integrity of some of the islands has begun to erode because of this lack of precaution. For China, speed and cheapness was the priority in these island-building campaigns, which explains why they were built so rapidly. Perhaps international observers should have been a little less alarmed. Much like China's belt and road infrastructure projects and domestic building efforts, quality control was not at the top of the list of priorities in the islands. It also does not help that China has little experience with building structures that would be designed to survive in the type of elements seen in the South China Sea. Beijing made the matter worse and exacerbated its disadvantage by refusing to call in foreign experts for assistance during the island building campaign. The result is that the islands and the infrastructure that make up the bases on top of them were not constructed with top-of-the-line materials. In fact, the islands at Subi Reef, Mischief Reef and Fiery Cross Reef in the Spratlys were so unstable that fighter jets from the People's Liberation Army Air Force PLAAF, had not landed on the airfields there by 2020. This is unlike Woody Island in the Paracels, which China has militarized with a runway capable of supporting the landing of heavy bombers, a feat it had demonstrated in 2018. The lack of use of the runways in the Spratly bases begs the question of why China would choose to build such long structures if they were not going to be used for aircraft. Experts concede that the decision not to land military aircraft there may be seen as a gesture of goodwill to reduce tensions in the region. However, given China's brazen and belligerent stance, this is unlikely. By far the likelier explanation is that the islands are in some way an illusion and cannot support such operations. The weather and climate will also be problems for China going forward. A hit from a powerful typhoon could prove far more devastating to the Chinese constructions than their shoddy concrete. As ocean water warms with a warming global climate, these super typhoons will probably occur in the South China Sea more frequently. China appears to have made no plans for this contingency, however. One super typhoon in the South China Sea hitting in the wrong place might undo all the years of effort Beijing put into its island-building campaign. A warming climate causes other difficulties for China's artificial islands. These islands were not built with any sea walls or other protective infrastructure to preserve them against rising waters. However, as the climate warms, glaciers in the Arctic and Antarctic melt and add to rising seas. Since 1992, global sea levels have risen by almost 4 inches and continue to rise at a rate of about 0.15 inches per year. NASA predicts that by 2050, sea levels along the American coastline could be 10 to 12 inches higher than they are today. And the more global temperatures warm, the faster the glaciers will melt and the more rapidly the ocean will rise. For example, the ocean rose twice as fast between 2013 and 2022 than it had between 1993 and 2002. Although it's uncertain how far sea levels will rise by the end of the century, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change estimates that in the best-case scenario, sea levels will rise between 11 and 21.5 inches from now to then. In worst-case scenarios, where competition between states and resurgent nationalism takes priority over environmental concerns, sea levels could rise as high as 40 inches. These sea level rises do not necessarily mean that all coastal communities as they currently exist will need to evacuate. Many communities have seawalls and other defenses. However, China's artificial islands are built at sea level and have no such defenses against erosion and rising waters. China meant the islands to be a string of permanent fortifications in the South China Sea, but it did not build them in a way that would be fit for this purpose. The problem of sea level rise gets worse when one considers that China destroyed vast swathes of coral reef and mangroves in the construction efforts. These structures form a natural barrier against the elements. This is because they break waves and dissipate their energy. Coral reefs allow for sediment to establish itself on the shallow and flat portions of the reef, where mangroves can establish themselves. Once there, the mangroves further break apart the energy of waves and storm surges since the roots and trunks of the trees absorb some of the water. When taken together, these coral reefs and mangroves provide a first line of defense against things like sea level rise and storm surges from typhoons. However, China destroyed these same ecosystems when it began constructing its artificial islands. In an ironic twist that some observers might call a case of poetic justice, China wiped out the very defenses that their islands would have needed to have more staying power in the wake of a warming climate, rising sea levels, 
and more frequent and powerful typhoons. In 2019, China claimed that it would begin work to restore the coral reefs in the Spratly Islands. China's Ministry of Natural Resources said that facilities to protect and recover these reefs had been installed on Fiery Cross, Subi, and Mischief Reefs. It also said it would survey more areas to identify where coral reefs had been damaged or destroyed and adopt a combination of natural and artificial methods to help the reefs recover themselves. However, China does not exactly have a good track record in this area because in 2015, its State Oceanic Administration claimed that construction of the artificial islands did not alter the health of the Spratly Islands ecosystem. These statements came at the same time that ships like the Tianying Hao were dredging and pulverizing the coral reefs. China also claimed that overfishing and natural causes had damaged the reef long before construction began. With such history, it's little wonder why few trusted China's word in 2019. And about five years later, there is still little evidence that China has meaningfully worked to restore the coral reefs in the Spratly Islands. Perhaps as sea levels rise and the risk of severe typhoons increase, Beijing will have no choice but to try to make good on its word out of calculations of self-interest. It has invested significant national prestige into its artificial island building campaign and created much bitterness around the world as the price for it. If these islands were to fail in their purpose, Beijing will have wasted a large amount of resources for little gain. However, there is another danger that comes with investing so much to try to shore the artificial islands up. Such investment in some ways defeats the very reason to build fortifications in the first place. The purpose of fortification is not to be an impregnable defense, but to make it more costly for an enemy to project power and to free resources for the builder of the fortification to project power in other theaters. By leaving comparatively few soldiers or weapon systems in a fortification, these assets of military power can be deployed elsewhere where they can be put to better use. However, at the rate the islands are deteriorating and threatened by weather and climate, China might need to continually concentrate resources on saving this great wall of sand, rather than using it as an effective method of statecraft. The fortifications that were supposed to be an aid to Chinese power projection might increasingly become a drain on it as they become more expensive to maintain in terms of money and labor hours spent on them. In some ways, the problems facing the artificial islands in the South China Sea were predictable as they follow a historical pattern concerning China. China is and always has been a colossus of a nation. However, it also has a history of not being able to live up to its full potential. For example, it was the wealthiest country in the world even into the 19th century. But despite this, it was unable to effectively use this advantage to compete with the Western powers and Japan. Now, history might be repeating itself. China is again a wealthy and powerful nation, but it is increasingly plagued with problems that might not permit it to achieve the full potential of its recovered status on the world stage. The expansion in the South China Sea has mirrored this age-old conundrum for Beijing. At first, it appeared the island-building campaign would solidify its place on the road to hegemony in the area. But through alienation of its neighbors, poor planning, and shoddy construction, these edifices might be the latest example of history repeating itself, with China not being able to take advantage of its latent potential. The islands were supposed to be a signal to the world that China was back, rejuvenated, as Xi Jinping might say. But if they sink, it will be a signal of another sort. There is no doubt that the artificial islands succeeded in accomplishing China's short-term goals for the South China Sea. However, the game of nations is always a marathon and not a sprint. If the islands cannot stay for the long haul, they will cost China far more than they have gained for it. But what do you think about China's artificial islands in the South China Sea? Do you think they will have the staying power and can be an effective method of power projection for China in the future? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. And also, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from Military Experts.